everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. We are continuing on with the disappearance of Shelly Miscavige, wife of David Miscavige, the dark and charismatic leader of the Church of Scientology. This is part two. So if you have not seen part one yet, I've linked it in the description box. I highly suggest that you start there because we covered a lot, including some basics of Scientology, their vernacular, their policies, their beliefs, etc., which are important to any future conversations that we have about Scientology. These two videos will also be my introduction to further episodes digging deeper into each aspect of Scientology, so stay tuned if this topic interests you. Now, I did post part one today. I posted part one today on the same day I'm recording this part. I always post the video unlisted like two, three, four days before I post it public because my Patreons um, have early access to it and sometimes the video gets demonetized. So then I put it in for a review and I give it some time so that whoever's reviewing it can come back and tell me whether it's approved or not. What was interesting about part one was I posted it several days ago and it was monetized and the Patreons watched it and it stayed monetized for like two days, over two days. And then as soon as I put the word Scientology into the title and the tags, it immediately went um, unmonetized or demonetized. And, you know, I had to have it reviewed, which I'm sure it's in the process of happening now, but sometimes that takes forever and there's no hope. Now, what's important to understand about this, it's not really about the money. It's about the fact that when you're demonetized, not only are you not getting paid for that video, but your video is suppressed. It's not shared. It's not recommended to other viewers. Sometimes your own subscribers aren't even notified that you posted it because it's considered not advertiser friendly, so YouTube won't push it. And it's just an interesting conversation to have. And the conversation would start with the question of why is YouTube protecting Scientology, I guess. <laughs> that would be that would be my question, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I will say, though, I did preemptively go ahead and purchase the domain name www.whoisstephanieharlow.com, you know, just to uh, make sure that, that they couldn't take it. So, <laughs> But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Native. I am so excited to talk about Native today because after recording last month's video where I talked about Native um, and, and I called for a campaign to bring back the cherry vanilla macaron scent full time, I was informed by someone who's a member of my Patreon that Native does have the scent full time, but it's hidden in their vintage section. So of course, of course, I immediately had to go and stock up. And I am happy to be able to tell you today that you too can stock up on the cherry vanilla macaron scent. They have it full time now, I guess in the vintage section. I'm so, so happy because Native's cherry vanilla macaron scent is my happy place. But of course, Native has tons of other amazing scents as well in both their deodorant and their body wash. Native deodorants are made with familiar and simple ingredients like coconut oil and shea butter, but simple does not mean ineffective. Far from it. Native's deodorants are aluminum and paraben-free, vegan and cruelty-free. They're non-sticky and fast drying, which is perfect for when you're on the go, which feels like all the time for me. And the deodorants offer 24-hour odor protection no matter what your day holds, whether you're working out, running around after the kids, or sitting in front of hot recording lights for hours, the only thing you're going to smell like is Native's delicious scents, which as we all know for me, has been cherry vanilla macaron. But I have so many other favorites as well, including Native's Baked by Melissa limited edition cupcake inspired collection. I am a huge fan of the ginger lemonade cupcake scent. It smells so good. I love, love the scent of ginger. Like cover me in ginger. But I also love their fresh peach cupcake. See, I got the big ones. I'm not messing around. I got the big sizes. But uh, my daughter, my little daughter, Bella, she will not take a bath without the tie-dye vanilla cupcake body wash. She loves how it smells. She loves the way the bottle looks. And they also have a mint cookie cupcake scent that is amazing. Native also offers their deodorants in a plastic-free version. It's the same great formula, just wrapped in a more sustainable packaging. The plastic-free version now comes in a new and improved 
approved package. It's earth friendly and 100% plastic free, which is always a good thing. And the cherry vanilla macaron scent actually happens to fall in their sensitive range. So the sensitive range is made without baking soda for those with sensitive skin. It's also vegan and they have this new magnesium oxide active and coconut oil based formula that's their strongest ever with 72 hours of odor protection. Of course, Native has so much more to offer than deodorant. Their body washes are hands down my favorite body wash of all time. As long as Native keeps making it, I will be uh, using it exclusively. Now, three deodorants would normally be $39, but if you use my link and my code, StephanieH19, you will get them for $26. That's over 33% off. With my code, you can also get 20% off any body wash or toothpaste, and I highly suggest you take advantage of that discount to stack up on the body washes. They're amazing. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys for listening to the sponsors and understanding that they do support this channel, especially in times when I'm likely to be demonetized, which apparently talking about Scientology on YouTube gets you demonetized. But thank you to Native so much, and let's jump in. When we last left off, some members of the Church of Scientology, some employees at Gold Base, had been noticing that their leader's wife, Shelley Miscavige, was looking rundown, sleep deprived, and generally as if she was under a great deal of stress. Now, it's said that in 2005, Shelley took on an impossible project, and this was the project of redesigning the org board. Now, I've talked to some people who were involved in the Church of Scientology and who have since left so that I could get a better idea of what this org board was and why it was so important to David Miscavige to the point where it apparently drove him crazy. Now, the org board was a creation of L. Ron Hubbard's, and he took inspiration from the org board that was used by some intergalactic ancient civilization. That's what he says, at least. Some others have said that he took inspiration from the org board of the United States Navy during World War II. But if you asked L. Ron Hubbard, it was the intergalactic ancient civilization. Now, this is a physical board that's posted in every church or organization. And by the way, these two words are used interchangeably church and organization when you're talking about Scientology. And the org board, it outlines what functions are done, the order they're done in, who's responsible for getting them done. It's so funny because I watched a Scientology video about what the org board is, like a Scientology approved video. And it was um, like a seven minute and 24 second video. And I swear, like seven minutes and 10 seconds of that video were spent explaining why being disorganized is bad and why you should be more organized and how you'll be more productive if you're more organized. And then there was like a 10 second watered down explanation of the org board. So basically it didn't help me at all. It cleared nothing up for me at all. Now the org board is supposed to keep everyone on task. It's supposed to keep everyone aware of who is handling what at any given time and what the chain of command looks like. Here is LRH sort of explaining it to us? Anyway, you will be seeing a, a lot of this org board, and uh, I'm really pointing out to you about this that there is something about it to understand. Uh, there's a great deal about it to understand. And the first, the first is that the org board does not change regardless of the size of the organization. It may get longer at the bottom, but it doesn't change in its significant characteristics, departments, divisions, or anything else. They remain constant. And it doesn't matter if it's a class zero org consisting of three guys trying to lift their heads up off the pavement as an organization, or an organization of 200,000 staff members. It would be the same org board. Now, I know that startles you, but I almost told you the real figure, two billion. <laughs> uh, this board is, uh, this board has a lot of back history, and uh, it is a refined board, and I may as well tell you the truth here amongst us girls. Uh, this is a refined board that I spoke to you about in an earlier lecture of an old galactic civilization. And you say, what's that doing amongst us? Well, we, we applied Scientology to it and found out why the civilization eventually failed. They lacked a couple of departments, and uh, that was enough to mess it all up. And uh, they only lasted a trillion. We'd be going a lot longer than that. So we want to get something substantial. 
<laughs> we don't want these temporary fly-by-night affairs. You know. <laughs> Matter of fact, practically every government of this planet has fallen on its head before it was even heard of. They, they, they go up and vanish so quick that history is practically unable to, to keep track of them. I'll bet you, I'll bet you just, just yesterday, just the other day, uh, 1500 B.C. You cannot tell me the primary civilization which was in existence. That's right, I thought you couldn't. <laughs> you don't know what government was in power in Europe and the Middle East in 1500 B.C. You see? Just that little tiny, tiny span of time. What is that, 3,500 years? You don't even remember. Temporary. <laughs> Makeshift didn't understand. Nobody had ever been to school about org boards. Didn't know anything about it. Actually, there have been lots of schools about org boards. They didn't have Scientology, but they did have org boards. And there have been some of the wildest org boards that have ever been invented. Don't consider the United States Army has any org board. It doesn't. Armies don't have org boards. They have command charts. <coughs> You want to see the picture of a suppressive person look at a, an org board of a military organization. So the ancient galactic civilization completely crumbled because it was just missing a few spots on the org board. Therefore, the org board is significantly important, right? Well, I mean, not really. I spoke with former Scientologist Aaron Smith-Levin to get some more clarification, and he explained it to me like this. After the death of L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology began to go into a steep decline. People were leaving and recruitment numbers were down. We talked about this in the video previous to this one. Obviously, a normal person or a normal organization is going to look to the person in charge of everything to explain why there's a problem and hopefully to find a potential solution to that problem. But in Scientology, it's more of a trickle-down model. David Miscavige could not place the blame for these declining membership numbers on himself or on the concept of Scientology as a whole. So in order for the entire image of the organization to retain legitimacy, he basically needed to blame everyone else for not doing their jobs correctly. It was at this time he began to retool and recalibrate certain aspects of Scientology, and he called this the golden age of tech. Now, according to davidmiscavige.org, quote, In order to bring about the golden age of tech, David Miscavige personally reviewed every L. Ron Hubbard original, issue by issue, word by word, comma by comma. He saw to the research and compilation of dozens of new courses comprising Scientology spiritual technology, the verification of 2,400 pages of scripture, exactly as written by Mr. Hubbard, all administrative policy for its application, and as a guarantee that it remain standard, and publication of monumental reference works specified by Mr. Hubbard, but never before compiled. This accomplishment was the culmination of tens of thousands of man hours spent reviewing thousands of individual writings and recorded lectures, closing the door forever on any possibility of unauthorized additions, omissions, or other alterations to Mr. Hubbard's works. End quote. All of these hours that Miscavige spent going through LRH's works and making sure that they were in tip-top shape would be significant for the individual Scientologist because, one, it would allow them to train in the religion with greater thoroughness and speed, and two, it would allow for flawless and rapid spiritual counseling progress. And three, it would give them a total confidence that all scripted materials and procedures were 100% correct and standard. So this reminds me a lot of the historical battle between, you know, Catholics and Protestants. When Protestants came on the scene, they took the Latin Bible and they translated the Bible into English because they wanted to be able to read it and kind of take their own analysis from it. They wanted the person to be responsible for their religious education. But the Catholics were like, nah, fam, that's not how we do it, right? We're going to keep the Bible in Latin because 
y'all don't speak Latin and just the clergy of the church does, just like the priests and stuff, because you should only be learning about God and religion through the priests. Otherwise, you could put your own spin on it. You could take something from it that wasn't meant to be taken from it. So this way, if it stays in Latin, we know that the only things you learn come from the top, come from the church, come from the priests. That way, you can't just be going off and, you know, taking what you want from this religion. And then they burned. They burned the English Bibles so people couldn't read them. Now, it's not really to make sure that people just aren't misinterpreting pieces of the religion or the religion as a whole. It's a control issue. You only know what we tell you. You only learn what we teach you. There's no space for self-governance or self-guidance. It's only from us that you can get this information. Therefore, the information will be only what we want it to be. And in my opinion, allegedly don't come for me, that's what David Miscavige is doing here. He doesn't necessarily want people to read LRH's works and start you know, coming up with what they think he means. Miscavige wants Scientologists to sort of only read what he thinks LRH's works meant. So the org board was just one of the many things that David Miscavige became obsessed with fixing and updating during this time. And he would give orders for the org board to be streamlined or made better, but he never specified how to streamline it or make it better or how he felt like they could go about doing that. So he would say to his upper management employees, like, hey, fix this, make it better, make it work better for us. They would modify it. They'd change it. They'd bring it back to him and he'd say, no, this isn't better. Go back and make it better without saying what was wrong with it or what he wanted changed or what he wanted the end result to look like, right? David Miscavige apparently has a habit of assigning impossible projects, impossible tasks, and many people believe that he didn't actually want the org board fixed. He just wanted to keep people busy and off balance, distracted, trying to figure out how to run a race when the finish line kept getting moved. Tony Ortega, who's done a lot of reporting on Scientology and has interviewed members who were present at Goldbase during this time, he wrote in his blog, quote, COB's obsession with the base org chart was wearing down everyone. Miscavige berated his underlings that they had not been able to place C org workers into positions on a complex chart of job descriptions at International Base. Although hundreds of people worked at the base and did their jobs, Miscavige was manic about the job organization chart. But whenever one of his top executives attempted to fill names in that chart, Miscavige rejected the scheme or simply wouldn't approve of it. And then he'd berate them again that he was going to have to do it all himself. It made little sense, and most people who worked at the base were sick of hearing it, end quote. So when we say gold base or int base or international base, they are all the same thing. They're just different names for the same place, which, I mean, is standard, I feel like, for Scientology, because things can't be con dry. Things can't be black and white. Things can't be simple. It has to be complicated. In 2005, David Miscavige announced that he was leaving Goldbase for a while and going to Los Angeles so that he could work on a new set of L. Ron Hubbard books that he was planning to edit and get published. At this point, Shelley Miscavige was left behind at Goldbase. A young woman who was a member of the Sea Org and stationed at Goldbase, she'd served as a steward to both David and Shelley, and she claims it was the first time she had ever seen the husband and wife not travel together. Now, at this point, it appears that Shelley decided to tackle the org board herself, filling the chart in with names and then informing people of what their new jobs were. Shelley also took on another project. There were constant renovations happening at Gold Base, and before leaving, David had been talking about moving his living quarters out of a place that they called the villas so that the villas could be turned into dorms for upper-level Scientology employees. Shelley apparently took it upon herself to have her husband's personal belongings packed up and moved into storage so that the planned renovations could begin. Now, it appeared that around this time, Shelley may have been concerned that her husband was pulling away from her, that maybe he was no longer 
completely invested in their relationship the way that she was. Mike Rinder, a top Scientology executive, he had visited David Miscavige in L.A., and when he returned to Gold Base, he claims Shelley had some questions for him. He said, quote, She took me to the back patio of the RTC building, which is really isolated. There was no one around. She asked me, when you saw him, was Dave wearing his gold or platinum wedding ring? The question was so out of the blue and so bizarre, I knew that she was in deep shit. She was worried that he was going to abandon her, end quote. Mike Rinder believes that Shelley just wanted to know if David was wearing a wedding ring, you know, his wedding ring. But asking that question outright, like, oh, was my husband wearing his wedding ring? It would have been too obvious. So she simply asked which ring he was wearing. And Mike Rinder told her he couldn't really remember if he had seen David wearing a ring or not. Rinder has also speculated about whether the fact that Shelley had managed to get into David's bad graces had provoked her to begin doing things that David had constantly complained needed to be done, such as the org board or, you know, the renovations. And maybe she was doing this in an attempt to get back on his good side to prove her worth to him. So a few months later, in the summer of 2005, David Miscavige returned to Gold Base, but he was not pleased with the changes Shelley had made, allegedly. A member who was on site when David found out the org board had been shuffled around and the villas were in the process of being renovated said, quote, he had a total psychotic fit. He said we were a bunch of treasonous fucks, end quote. So David Miscavige apparently liked to swear a lot. I'm just going to say that now. He liked to swear a lot. I'm going to turn to a woman named Valerie Haney, who escaped from Gold Base and Scientology in 2016 when she hid in the trunk of a car. According to Valerie Haney, she had asked to leave Gold Base several times, but she was told she couldn't because she had worked so closely with David Miscavige. Remember that Gold Base is the home of Scientology's production company, Golden Era Productions, and there was a film being made there at this time, so Valerie managed to get into the trunk of a non-Scientologist member of the film crew and finally escape. Now, what did it mean that Valerie had worked closely with David Miscavige so she couldn't leave Gold Base? Well, according to her, it was that she knew too many embarrassing and private details about COB. In her words, quote, that he drank every night. It kind of got worse as the hole was forming in 2004, and I knew how much he drank. I gave him his meals. I made his bed. I woke him up in the morning. I knew everything about their private lives, end quote. Valerie was also close to Shelley Miscavige proximity-wise, and she had an inner look into Shelley and David's marriage, which according to Valerie was not a super intimate or warm one. Valerie said, quote, maybe they had sex once a year, if that. I worked for them for three years, and I recognized twice that they had sex, and Shelly was just fucked up about it. I was a very sexual person, and I would have sex with my husband every night and then tell her, I mean, we were girlfriends. Shelly hated it because he was not affectionate to her. Even in closed quarters, he wasn't showing her affection. I'm in the living room, and I'm the only one standing there with them, and it's Christmas, and there's no warm embrace, no kiss. She had a separate room. They had a bedroom, but she had a dressing room where she would unwind and smoke, and she would talk with me about Dave, sometimes for hours. She was jealous of Loris. She would ask me, are they fucking? Can you find out? But they weren't. It would be impossible for me not to know, end quote. Okay, so when Valerie refers to Loris, she's talking about Loris Henley Smith, who's allegedly David Miscavige's personal communicator, and we'll talk a bit more about her in this episode and others. But for the sake of context, let's talk about an average day at Gold Base for David Miscavige because this will help us better understand certain actions he would take later and why they were either par for the course or odd, considering his normal behavior. According to Valerie Haney, David Miscavige didn't want anyone inside or outside of Scientology to know about his finances and his schedule, specifically how different his workday was 
compared to everyone else around him. David would sleep in every morning, waking up at 11 a.m. He would then go into his office, the office he had in his living quarters, to do what he called traffic. And that was basically going through all the submissions that had come in overnight, essentially people asking for his permission or his approval to do something. And there was probably a lot of traffic because it seems like no one could make a move without the green light from COB. Around 12 or 12.30, David would have lunch with Shelly and his personal communicator, Larisse, who we will call Lou, because that's basically what everyone calls her. They call her Lou. Valerie Haney, who remembers a steward at this point to both Shelly and David, so she's sort of like serving them. She does their cleaning, makes their beds. She's kind of like their maid. But anyways, Valerie said, quote, Shelly had her own office space, but she always wanted to eat with him. But he would talk to Lou the whole time. I would bring the food for all three of them. And if Lou didn't have something for her meal, he would scream at me because Lou wasn't happy. But he didn't give a fuck about Shelly's meal, end quote. Valerie said a typical breakfast for David Miscavige was poached eggs, sometimes an omelet, toast, or an English muffin, as well as coffee. Now, if David was on a diet, he would have five egg whites and one yolk, turkey bacon, and half a slice of bread. And we will talk about this later, but David Miscavige seems to be very um, concerned with his physical appearance. He wants to look good. He wants to stay trim, fit, always have a nice suit on. The suit's always pressed. There's rumors that he had a tanning bed in his living quarters so that he could always have that California glow, but we'll get more into that. So after eating, David would then go to Building 50. Now, this was the place where David's professional office was. The office he ate breakfast in was located in his living quarters. Building 50 had been built specifically for Miscavige and the Religious Technology Center because apparently there's a power plant located on Gold Base and it supplies the whole base with electricity. And it was very loud. So David wanted his office built far enough away from it so he wouldn't be disturbed. Now, once he was officially at work, Valerie said that David would, quote, either have a meeting and scream at people or he would go into his lounge and watch sports or walk around and smoke. He was very lackadaisical about it. While every other Sea Org member on the base was tearing around, walking fast and taking 15 minute breaks, end quote. Now, something I've discovered is that it seems like a lot of Scientologists like to swear and smoke. And I'm not applying that to, you know, your part-time Scientologist who just goes to the church and does courses. I'm talking about the people who are, like, in it, like the Sea Org members who are living at the church, working at the church, who are constantly exposed to it. Probably they smoke because they're stressed out. I don't know. But a lot of them swear a lot and smoke a lot. So after screaming at people or watching sports in his lounge, David would then have lunch with Shelly and Lou, and they would join him again for dinner, and sometimes the trio would invite a fourth person to dine with them. Now, Valerie claims if this fourth person had done something wrong to get into trouble with David, they would still be invited to dinner, but Valerie would be asked to prepare a special surprise for them, like putting cayenne pepper into their coffee. After dinner, David would have meetings, and then he would watch television. He especially liked the show Alias, starring Jennifer Garner. On weekends, David would go to the movies to see the latest film releases. And Valerie said, quote, It didn't seem to bother him that he spent a lot of time watching sports or films when the people around him were running from place to place on a never-ending emergency schedule, never with time to watch TV or movies, end quote. Valerie also described David's nighttime routine. By midnight, he would be in his lounge drinking scotch with Lou, and apparently Shelly did not like her husband drinking, and she would attempt to prevent Valerie from bringing it to him because Scientologists, well, specifically Sea Org members, they're not supposed to drink alcohol. Valerie Haney said, quote, This would be nightly. He would drink scotch, smoke, and talk to Lou. I was there, so I know they didn't fuck. I was in the room, end quote. She's talking about David and Lou, and she says they weren't having sex, that they weren't intimate, because a lot of people say that 
David was cheating on Shelly with Lou, but there's no evidence of that. And many people I have talked to have said it's it's very unlikely that he was because there'd be too much chance of, you know, that getting out, of the truth coming out. And if that happened, he would be looked at very negatively and it would sort of detract from the power and the spell that he had on people. So some people think he was sleeping with Lou. Some people say, absolutely not. We don't think that would ever happen. But I think it's safe to say, according to what we hear from Valerie Haney and Mike Rinder, Shelley may have been suspecting that David was pulling away from her, that he wasn't interested or in love with her anymore. Whether or not she thought that was because there was a third party involved or there was another woman, We don't really know. So Shelly and David's relationship had been going downhill for a while. But in the summer of 2004, people close to the couple began to see the cracks. Now, the Church of Scientology owns a huge cruise ship called the Free Winds. Now, I guess the Free Winds would be a different experience for you based on where you rank in the organization. According to a Scientology website, the Free Winds is a safe, aesthetic, distraction-free environment appropriate for ministration and spiritual auditing, a place where Scientologists can reach OT8, the highest level of spiritual attainment. The church says, quote, The Free Winds is like no other place on earth. It truly marks the beginning of a voyage to all eternity, end quote. That might be accurate, at least the eternity part, because many people have claimed that they were brought on the free winds and then not allowed to leave. A woman named Valeska Paris claims that she was sent to the ship by David Miscavige when she was 18, and this was done to prevent Valeska's mother from taking her away from Scientology. And Valeska said, quote, I found out two hours before my plane left. I was woken up in the morning, and I was sent to the ship for two weeks, end quote. At least that's what she was told, right? She was woken up, and she was like, you're going to the ship. You're going to the free winds for two weeks. It's going to be a cruise. You're going to have a nice vacation. But she ended up being on the free winds for 12 years. Valeska went on to say, quote, they take your passport when you go on the ship, and you're in the middle of an island, so it's a bit hard to escape. And by that time, I was 18. I'd been in Scientology my whole life. It's not like I knew how to escape. I did not want to be there. I made it clear I did not want to be there. And that was considered bad ethics, meaning it was considered not right, end quote. So when an average Scientology member is sent to the free winds, they spend most of their time performing hard labor, usually in the engine room. But if you're Tom Cruise, the free winds is a lovely place to be. Every June, the Church of Scientology hosts a massive party on the Free Winds to celebrate its maiden journey. And in 2004, this celebration also included an extravagant birthday party for Tom Cruise. Now, if you saw the Going Clear documentary, you also saw the cringy clip of Tom Cruise jumping up on stage to relive his risky business days, singing his own awkward rendition of old-time rock and roll. So embarrassing, man. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> and the alleged bill for this birthday party that Scientology threw for Tom Cruise on the free ones was four hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I can't believe. I mean, I can believe it, but damn. So Scientology flew in chefs from Nobu. They flew in chefs from Tom's favorite Paris restaurant. Everyone was munching on lobster, sipping champagne, which is probably a good thing now that I think about it because I feel like I would need to be real drunk on that bubbly in order to watch that performance by Tom Cruise and not laugh my ass off because I'm sure 
laughing at Tom Cruise would get you declared a suppressive person, or at the very least thrown overboard. Valerie Haney claimed that during the summer of 2004, Cruise and Miscavige were spending a lot of time together, and Shelley was wondering when her husband would have the time of day for her. Valerie Haney said, quote, Shelley was getting sick of Dave's lack of response to her and of his arrogance and the way he was mistreating people, end quote. But apparently during the celebration on the free wins, David showed his disgust for Shelley in front of others. And Valerie Haney said, quote, on the free wins, he denigrated Shelley in front of the other executives. She was crying in her room, end quote. By 2005, things were getting worse, not better. Valerie Haney claims that David was raging at everyone every single day, except for Lou, who he was spending more time with. Valerie said, quote, he had nothing for Shelly. She was crying every night. She snapped at him a couple times. Oh, you're going with Larisse? Things like that, end quote. When David began spending more and more time away from Goldbase and away from his wife, people noticed how unusual it was. But they didn't have much time to think about it because, according to Valerie, everyone who was connected to Shelly was removed from their posts and shuffled around. Valerie said, quote, I was removed and got put on decks, hard labor, digging ditches. They were sec checking me. Has Shelly said anything, they asked. They were investigating me and another girl. I think they were gathering information before they were going to investigate Shelly herself, end quote. Once again, we have a term here, sec checking, that may need some explanation. Sec check is short for security check, and it's done like auditing is done with an auditor and an e-meter, but it's more like an interrogation. So in this context, I suppose the e-meter becomes kind of like a lie detector test. Have you ever injured Dianetics or Scientology? No. Have you ever committed any overts on a Scientology organization? No. Have you wronged anyone in a Scientology organization? No. Do you have any overts on L. Ron Hubbard? No. Have you ever had any unkind thoughts about L. Ron Hubbard? No. Have you done bad things to leaders of Scientology or Scientology orgs? No. Have you ever withheld anything from executives in Scientology? No. Are you in disagreement with any of the stable data of Scientology? No. Are you making any Scientologist guilty of anything? No. Have you done anything that would discredit Ron Hubbard or your instructors by reason of their having trained you? No. Do you have any secret plans against Scientology? No. Do you deserve to be helped by Scientology? Yes. How do you feel about these questions? I'm... I'm... I'm confused. We talked about Shelley filling in the org board and how allegedly David hadn't liked that. After he blew up on her for this, he returned to Los Angeles and Shelley spent a week being sec checked. Allegedly, at some point during this week, Shelley had managed to get a hold of a car and she drove to LA in a last ditch effort to fix whatever was broken between herself and her husband, David, but she was sent back with her tail between her legs. It was when she returned that Shelley tried again to do something she thought would make her husband happy which was moving his things out of the villas so that the renovations David had been banging on about could begin. Valerie Haney claims that David got word in Los Angeles that Shelley had done this, and Valerie said, quote, Dave found out about it, that she had touched his stuff, and the very next day she was gone, end quote. Valerie claims the last time she saw Shelley, Shelley was getting into the passenger side of a car that drove away from Gold Base. When Shelley never came back, those left behind at Gold Base told each other, she must have done something to deserve being sent away. She must have betrayed her husband in some way. She must have been treasonous. In November of 2006, Leah Remini flew to Italy to attend the wedding of Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. Everyone who was anyone in Hollywood was there, including Brooke Shields, Will Smith, and Jada Pinkett Smith, David and Victoria Beckham, Jim Carrey, Jennifer Lopez, so on and so forth. And anyone who was anyone in Scientology was there, including C.O.B. himself, David Miscavige, who acted as Tom's best man. But it was not his wife, Shelley, who was on his arm for this glittering and glamorous event. It was Loris, Lou, who had become David's constant companion in the wake of Shelley's disappearing act. Now, Leah Remini was obviously surprised by Shelley's absence at the wedding, and she wondered out loud where C.O.B.'s wife was. 
According to Leah, she was told by Scientology executive Tommy Davis, who acted as Tom Cruise's personal handler, quote, you don't have the fucking rank to ask about this, end quote. When referring to this specific statement, ex-Scientologist Mike Rinder said, quote, they believe the world doesn't have the fucking rank to ask about this. It's an interesting look at the mindset of Scientologists and how out of touch with reality they are. They've lost touch with the world, end quote. Leah claims she personally spoke to David Miscavige at the wedding, and he told her that Shelley was fine, but he had to keep Shelley away because suppressive people were constantly trying to have her subpoenaed. Leah witnessed a lot of things at this wedding that she felt were strange and inappropriate. Now, you have to remember, at this time, she was still pretty much a diehard Scientologist, and Scientologists are expected to behave in a certain way. In her book, Troublemaker, Leah wrote, quote, Had everyone in my church lost their minds? This was all just too weird. Top officials were here going against everything I was taught and believed to be right. I'd seen behind the curtain. There, in the role of the great and powerful Oz, was not LRH, as I had come to believe, but instead, it seemed to be Tom Cruise. All of these rules appeared to have been broken because of or in relation to him and his standing in the church. Was my church falling apart? Was Tom in charge? End quote. So basically, if you're a Scientologist, you aren't really supposed to drink. Like, you technically can drink, but there's rules in place that ensure you never really have a chance to drink. So yeah, so, so, so let's say you go, you and I went out. We were just went out okay. one night. We're going we out, out for dinner. Right. A group of us. And something you didn't and like. And I saw you doing something that's not like per the book. I have to write a report on like, you. Are you allowed to drink? Not really. No. Okay, you, what if I got lit up? Um, I'd probably write a report Brought and some say... some shots over. Come on, fuck it. LRH would love it. I, okay. I Let's do say, it to LRH. Clink. Okay, so then I... Yes, so then I write a report on you. Oh. And I said, Joe was acting inappropriate. He was making fun of L. Ron Hubbard because you're not allowed to joke and degrade L. Ron Hubbard. There's a policy called jokers and degraders. Um, jokers and, and degraders. degraders. Yes, you and I would be very much... I've been... Yes. Ooh, have you been in trouble for that? Many times. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, I would have to write a report. It's called writing you up. I'd have to write you up because okay. let's say you went into like the next day okay. for a session and you said... And they said, you know, they do the check. They do a check on you every day. Um, do you have an upset? Do you have a present time problem? Or are you withholding anything? Now, if you were a real Scientologist, you would know that you probably shouldn't be drinking, carrying on, because it's a 24-hour rule. You can't drink 24 hours before you're going to be doing a service. Re remember, you're required to go in every day. So you never can drink. Right. And if you, you do, to, uh -huh. you consider it a transgression. So that's on your mind that you're withholding this information. Now, if you went on a vacation and you knew that you were going to make it up when you got back. Yeah, that's okay. Then you can, you can yeah, have a couple of my Because right. you're not going okay. in. Okay. That's the only time then. Correct. Or if you're just not getting a service. But that's okay. the, if you're but not you getting a service. Every day. Correct. So you'd go in and you'd say, okay, so I went out last night. I ordered you know, a bunch of shots and I made a comment about to L. Ron Hubbard or whatever. And they go, okay, great. When was it? Who'd you do it with? Who was there? They write down all the names. It's also being recorded. Um, and they're writing everything down. Who knew about it will be the next question. Who knew about it? You'd say, well, Leah was there. They go, Leah was there. Okay, interesting. Then that person's going to write, Leah knew about it and didn't do anything about it. Mm. Then I'd get pulled in. Why didn't you write a report on Joe? Because Joe just admitted that he was drinking, carrying on, and you didn't write him up. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's, yeah. a, it's it creates that kind of environment. So it's a rat environment. Correct. So I was I was writing up Tom, and I was writing up David Miscavige. So what did you write up Tom for? Jumping on couches and being inappropriate. <laughs> I thought he was being inappropriate. What was he jumping on couches for? Well, when he did Oprah. But so you wrote a whole thing about him jumping up on Oprah's couch. Yes, but I also listen. I, I gave myself up. I you know I was writing right. I was writing myself up. I was writing my mother up. I was but writing jumped, my husband up. He jumped up on Oprah's couch because he was in love, right? Supposedly. You know, he jumped up, you know, I Well, that's what they her, told me. They, they pulled me in and they said, you know, could it be that you're just not as high on a scale, like, in life? Like, you're so... Basically, they were saying, like, you're a bitch, so you can't understand... <laughs> you can't understand that kind of love. Because I was like, oh. right, I guess because I've been married 20 years. I don't understand jumping on a couch. Um, but I thought it was a... It wasn't... 
um, a good example mm. because because I cared so much about my church and the work that we were doing, and I didn't want the church to be seen as a joke or it's or one of its senior members, which he's considered a right. senior Scientologist. Um, so you just thought it was inappropriate. It was out of line. So yeah, you, and I you just felt like him. you had an obligation. Right. I mean, listen, uh, I'm not perfect. I mean, of course, there's many things that would be considered a bad example in my everyday. I'm not a great example. Um, but at the time, I thought I was pr pretty pristine. But looking at it now, you feel like it's totally innocuous. He's just on a couch jumping around having a good time. Yes, but yeah. if you knew how serious Scientology was about clearing the planet, it did not go with right. our intentions and our goals. Um, so anyway, I was writing him up, and I was writing everybody up, and I was writing everybody up at the wedding because I thought our senior executives <laughs> were, and I was like wiring them back from Italy from my hotel room. Uh, calling one of my closest friends who is a Scientologist, and I'm like, and then I need you to write this. I need you to write this verbatim. I need you to write this verbatim, and I need you to get this to the watchdog committee. And I, I think I hurled. You were frantic. Frantic, because I, <laughs> I was frantic, and I was heartbroken because wow. it, it's like seeing. If you believe that the Sea Organization and and the people at the higher you know, that are senior executive strata of your church are living a pristine and perfect life that you're trying to aspire to, that you're spending your day and night and money and time, like, you're, this is what we're trying to be, and I'm seeing not great examples of what this is now. Like, it's seen behind the curtain. I was like, I don't want to see this. And I really thought I was going to save the church. I thought my writing reports was like, I'm going to take over the church, and I'm going to get it right. By L. Ron Hubbard. I really still believed in the policies of L. Ron Hubbard. I just believe they were bending the rules for a celebrity. And I was like, he's a celebrity. Who gives a shit what he's doing? Like, he's a Scientologist first and a celebrity second to me. Leah also said that Tommy Davis and another Scientologist, a Sea Org member named Jessica Feshbach, they were in Italy at the wedding without their spouses, and she claims that like at the rehearsal dinner and stuff, they had their hands all over each other. In her book, Leah writes that this was, quote, another major taboo. Sea Org members are absolutely forbidden from touching members of the opposite sex aside from their spouses, end quote. There's other things that Leah saw at the wedding or the rehearsal dinner or her time in Italy that had her really like going crazy. Um, if you read her book, you'll know what I mean. But she mentions how Tom and Katie's daughter, Suri, was being treated like a god, like everyone in Scientology was sort of like catering to Suri. I think if I can remember correctly from her book, and I'm just paraphrasing, she said something like, you know, they were treating Suri like like she was L. Ron Hubbard. And Suri was just a little little baby girl at this time. So Leah's obviously in a tailspin by this. She doesn't really know what's going on. When she got back to L.A. after the wedding, she'd already filed all of these reports based on everything she had witnessed. And when she got back from Italy, she was on hiatus from working on her show, King of Queens. So she'd been planning to go to Clearwater, Florida for a six to eight week upper level course at the church's flag land base. This is a seven story, 300,000 square foot building on Fort Harrison Avenue in Clearwater. According to Tony Ortega and former members of the church, Scientology promotes Flag Base in Clearwater as a truly special place where Scientologists from all over the world are told that they must make a pilgrimage in order to attain certain high-level processes that they can get no place else. Members of Scientology, especially wealthy members, are constantly being convinced to put their lives on hold for months at a time to fly to Florida and spend tens of thousands of dollars for these courses. So Leah was going to Clearwater already for these upper level courses, but when she got back to LA, they told her like, oh, you're going down early. Still, she didn't suspect anything, right? But as soon as she arrived in Clearwater, she was told that she was first going to ethics where she was then confronted with all of these reports called knowledge reports that apparently other Scientology members who worked for Tom Cruise had written about her. In her book, Leah writes, quote, according to these reports, I was the rudest person ever to walk the face of the earth. 
All my crimes were on the spectrum of things that you have immature fights about in your teenage years. Apparently, the delay of the wedding ceremony, which started 45 minutes behind schedule, was my fault because I showed up late to the castle, end quote. And that whole showing up late thing was just one of the examples that she had given. Um, There was a bunch of examples, but in her opinion, you know, they were all petty, stupid things that she hadn't even been responsible for. So for instance, you know, they could say like, you know, it rained on the day of Tom's wedding and that was because you were in such a bad mood and you made it rain like that chick from Encanto. Leah also was told there was a report allegedly written by Katie Holmes claiming that Leah's behavior the weekend of the wedding was upsetting to her and Leah had set a poor example to others. And it went on and on like this for three months. Right. So you uh, take out these reports on him. I write these reports. I'm sent to um, Florida immediately, the Mecca, the hub of Scientology. Clearwater. That's right. For interrogations. <laughs> no, and I mean like interrogations. So you have to fly out there. I fly out there. I'm uh, in the room. I'm in a room, you know, with, with cameras, with my person who is is armed with information unbeknownst to me of a stack of reports that were written on me by everybody who worked for tom a stack now let me because tell you tom found out about your report so he decided that everyone who works for him has to take out a report on you i don't know what he knew but that that is that the church is very much involved with his life he's staffed by people who work for the church no non-scientologist works for him but it was if you say something bad about this person you were talking about God and you and I was asked do you have sexual intentions towards him what are your evil intentions towards him what are your evil intentions towards David Miscavige what are your evil intentions towards L. Ron Hubbard and it was three months of this it was and I had to retract everything I said I said I made it all up I didn't see any of it Whoa. to get out of there and wow. so then when I came back to LA they said they want to see you again here in Celebrity Center so I went to Celebrity Center and they said look everything that was done to you was wrong I was like right I know that we just want to let it go you need to let it go because if the fact that you're not letting go means that you're guilty of the crimes that you're saying uh, I'm confused so yeah. they're saying that everything was wrong that was done to you in mm-hmm. Florida why but are they, they saying that Because they wanted me to come back because I was kind of like, I'm not, when I came back from Florida, I was kind of not really a dedicated Scientologist anymore. But I wasn't doing anything to rock the boat with my family. How long were you in Florida for? uh, Three months. Three months Mm -hmm. of of, of dealing with this? Mm -hmm. Three months? Uh Every day for three months? uh I had to write apology letters. 90 days? Uh So you're there for 90 days. All you're talking about is Tom Cruise's wedding. It was during my hiatus. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing most of the time. And and you have a family. You're married. My mother was there. My my daughter was there. My husband was there. And how much of the, of the day are you spending on all this day. stuff? All day. All day. Every day. They call this process the truth rundown. And Leah eventually felt the only way she would be allowed to leave Clearwater and go home was if she claimed everything she had written in her reports had been fabricated. And keep in mind, she was paying for this treatment. She was paying to be, like, interrogated and harassed to the tune of $300,000, money that went towards the auditing needed to get her reprogrammed. The next and last time Shelley Miscavige was seen was at her father's funeral in 2007, which she attended in the company of another Scientology member who was assigned as her handler, basically to watch her. It was reported that during this funeral, Shelley went to the bathroom, and there she was approached by another member who was under investigation for being a suppressive person, and this other member wanted to know if Shelley might be able to help her get out of trouble. According to this person, Shelley told her, quote, listen to me, I fucked up and I'm not going to be able to help you, end quote. A few weeks after Shelley had vanished, John Brousseau claims he was summoned to the office she had once occupied. Now, I mentioned John Brousseau briefly in the first episode, and according to a 2012 article in The Village Voice, John and David Miscavige had been brothers-in-law at one point, and quote, they were both young cameramen working for Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard during his movie-making phase. 
Broussel was Hubbard's personal chauffeur and helped maintain the cloak of secrecy when Hubbard vanished for good. He watched Miscavige transform Scientology and turn its base into a prison camp, end quote. So John Brousseau goes to Shelley's old office, and he claims that David Miscavige was waiting there for him with Lou, David's constant companion at this time. David asked John if he could break into a hidden panel in the wall of Shelley's office, because apparently this hidden panel concealed a walk-in closet, and inside the closet were a bunch of, like, locked filing cabinets. Apparently, Shelley Miscavige was the only one who had a key to this hidden wall panel and probably the cabinets inside as well. So John says he removed the panel and then he was dismissed from the office. But a few hours later, David Miscavige summoned him back to the office and asked if he could pick the locks of the filing cabinets, which John did. Brousseau said, quote, a couple weeks later, when Miscavige was no longer at the property, I was summoned by another office secretary. She said I could repair the lock and get it rekeyed with the exact same key and make it look like nothing had happened, end quote. John was also around Shelley in the weeks before she disappeared. And John had known Shelley for a very long time, since she was young. And he felt that her mood was very low during that time because she knew she had somehow messed up, putting herself on the wrong side of David Miscavige. John said, quote, She puttered around for maybe a week or two, being very sheepish and withdrawn, not really contributing, telling her domestic staff not to bother taking care of her, that she could make her own meals. She'd say, it's all right, and sort of be very undeserving, knowing that she was in a crap load of trouble, end quote. And I mentioned that John Brousseau had witnessed David Miscavige turn Scientology's base into a prison camp, so I want to elaborate on that a bit, because John's referring to Gold Base, and the prison camp was created by him at the behest of David Miscavige with the purpose of punishing Scientology's top executives. What they were being punished for? They didn't really know. Maybe David Miscavige himself didn't really know either. Once again, for context, I'm going to go over what the whole was and how it came to be because it's important and it will come up in later episodes. We know that Miscavige was becoming more angry, more paranoid, and more violent in the years leading up to Shelley's disappearance. And many suspected that it was because Scientology as a whole was not doing well. Membership was down. People were leaving. People were speaking to the media. The media was printing stories. The internet became a thing where random people could just print stories or talk about Scientology. People were asking questions about what was really going on behind closed doors in this tax-exempt church, and the pressure was on. But the average Scientologist could not know how bad things were. As I mentioned previously, I spoke to former member Aaron Smith Levin, and he told me that he worked for Scientology full time from 1993 to 2006. And during this period, he never once suspected that Scientology was going downhill. Now, if you were an upper level executive like Mike Rinder or Marty Rathbun, you would have some idea that things weren't great, they weren't perfect, but you would also be made to feel that it was all your fault. Those at the middle and lower levels were so busy with their own tasks and their own statistics that they didn't have time to even think about anything big picture, and no one would really dare to ask questions about it even if they did have a thought. Now, when I say statistics, I'm basically referring to your output as an employee of the church. These people work within what is called one-week condition formulas, meaning they're not allowed to think ahead more than one week in the future. Now, the example Aaron gave me was that of a receptionist answering and rerouting phone calls. Let's say you're a receptionist, you work for Scientology. This receptionist is going to be required to keep a tally of all her calls successfully received and rerouted. Those numbers would be her statistics. You can only pay attention to your statistics one week at a time. And if they're down from the week before, there's no excuse you can make for why that is. You just have to make sure that you improve your stats and fast. So let's say you're a receptionist and you're working during a week that's like a Christmas week, you know, and so you're closed. Let's say you're closed three days of that week because it's Christmas. So you're obviously not taking any calls during that time. 
When your superior calls you in and says, why are these stats so low? Why are your stats shit? A normal person would say, well, sir or ma'am, we were closed for three days last week for the Christmas holiday. So obviously, for a 72-hour period, I was unable to answer any calls because I wasn't here. Nobody was here and nobody was calling. And your superior in Scientology would say, that's not an excuse. The fact that you're trying to make an excuse lets me know you've done something wrong and you know you've done something wrong. And it's just this very backwards, circular logic that never actually ends up being logical at all. These people are working in a pressure cooker. And being in that environment means they don't really have the time to wonder what's happening at higher levels or what's happening with Scientology as a whole. Because the majority of the people in the organization thought that everything was just peachy keen, David Miscavige was only able to take his anger out on a small percentage of upper-level management figures who were somewhat aware that things weren't great because they were being blamed for the decline of Scientology and they were being ordered to fix this decline. So for a while, these people were being verbally and physically assaulted by David Miscavige for their shortcomings, but it was in 2004 when this abuse escalated, leading to the creation of The Whole. So when David Miscavige took over as COB, he ordered several different projects to be completed at Gold Base, including the construction of Building 50, which would become the Religious Technology Center and also the location of his office. But when David began spending less time at Gold Base and more time in Los Angeles, his absence posed a problem. John Brousseau said, quote, What's left is just a bunch of people who are a very high security risk because they were there during the Miscavige unplugged days, end quote. What John is referring to is this period in 2004 when David began to turn on his own management staff and turn them against each other. John Brousseau claims, quote, I remember that he was really wailing on these guys for several weeks. What a bunch of suppressive criminal pieces of shit they were, he said, and that he should just offload them. Miscavige was in this constant, unending fury, end quote. So one day, David Miscavige had roughly 50 members of his international management go to Building 50, where they were presented with papers that they were told to use to write down their crimes against humanity, their crimes against Scientology, their crimes against David himself. These people were kept in a locked room in Building 50 for the whole day without food, and while they wrote down their sins, David Miscavige told John Brousseau to modify two double-wide trailers on the base, and he basically told John, like, turn these trailers into a prison, and that prison would later become known as The Hole. John Brousseau said, quote, So I went down to the big garage. I knew where everything was. I rummaged around and found some real heavy chrome-plated steel tubing. I went in and measured every door, cut the pipe, made holes at the end with a drill press, and then put them on with these big nasty screws. I put bars on each of the three doors. In the windows, I put in a block with weird screws that no one would have a bit for in their pocket. The next morning, these people all got marched down to the new hole that I'd built, end quote. And according to the book, Going Clear, and according to the people who were trapped in this place, there was no furniture in these trailers. There was only a long conference table and some, like, rough outdoor carpet. The executives would have to eat standing up. They would have to sleep on the floor, which apparently was swarming with ants. Each morning, they would be marched outside for group showers with a hose, and then they would be put back into the hole. The book Going Clear says, quote, Their meals were brought to them, a slop of reheated leftovers. When temperatures in the desert location mounted to more than 100 degrees, Miscavige turned off the electricity, letting the executives roast inside the locked quarters. At odd, unpredictable hours, often in the middle of the night, Miscavige would show up in the hole, accompanied by his wife Shelley and his communicator, Larice, each of whom carried a tape recorder to take down whatever Miscavige had to say. The detainees could hear the drumbeat of the shoes as Miscavige's entourage marched toward the trailers. The leader demanded that the executives engage in what were termed seances, endless hours of confession about their crimes and failures in this and previous lives, as well as whatever dark thoughts, counter-intentions they might be harboring against him. If someone was not forthcoming with such confessions, 
the group would harass that person until he produced a confession, end quote. At first, about 40 men and women occupied the hole. Later, the number grew to 100, as Miscavige deemed more and more officers to be underperforming. Scientology's former spokesperson, Mike Rinder, says he was there from the start. This practice of group confessions grew up in the hole, and it was some thing where Miscavige has ha, developed this idea that you had to confess to your peers all of your horrible transgressions and that they were supposed to extract out of you these transgressions, particularly related to your trans theoretical transgressions against Miscavige himself. Like, what have you done to COB? What have you done to try and hurt COB? What have you done here? What have you, I mean, this is like the mantra of the whole. This would be carried out by whoever happened to be there, 20 people, 30 people, 50 people, all standing up there and screaming at you about, tell us why. And eventually, you know, it, it sort of devolved into ultimately physical violence and torture to extricate these, quote, confessions out of people. So back in the day, during his time on the Apollo, during his time on the high seas, it has been alleged that L. Ron Hubbard would basically throw Sea Org members overboard as a punishment. It appears that David Miscavige developed his own version of this using a swimming pool at Gold Base. At 10 p.m. on one cold winter night, the executives were removed from the hole and they were ordered to jump one by one from the diving board into the pool while they were wearing their Sea Org uniforms. As they jumped, a man named Norman Starkey, who had once captained the Apollo, recited a traditional Sea Org saying, We commit your sins and errors to the deep and trust you will rise a better Thetan. Miscavige then ordered the group to go into an office, still in their wet clothes, and they were told that they were going to be staying there until they had figured out where they had failed. The church spokesperson, Tommy Davis, has admitted that this happened and claims it was part of the justice system that the church imposes on poor performers. Davis cited L. Ron Hubbard's policy that encourages members to come clean when they've done something to bring down the group, stating, quote, it's not for the purposes of punishment, and it's certainly never for the purpose of trying to make the person feel guilty about it, end quote. Which is just ridiculous, right? I mean, psychology, human nature, if you berate somebody about something they've done wrong, even if they've legitimately done something wrong, which as far as I'm concerned, none of these people did do anything wrong, what they were unable to do was read David Miscavige's mind. They didn't know what he wanted. They didn't know how to fix the problems with Scientology that had been created not by them, but by outside influences, by people from the inside going on the outside. Like, you can't fix that. Once the genie's out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. So how were they going to fix Scientology's image? How were they going to fix Scientology's membership numbers when all of this stuff was already out there on the internet and in the media for anyone to look up? Except if you're in Scientology, of course, because you can't look it up if you're a Scientologist. So, of course, when you're making somebody, like, stand there and tell you why they suck and why they're terrible at their job and all the mistakes they've made, and then you make them, like, jump into the pool and sit there in some wet Sea Orc uniform and think about what they've done, there's going to be an aspect of guilt. Like, if you're not trying to make the person feel guilty about it, then what are you trying to do? Norman Starkey, like I said, he was the former captain of the Apollo, he also finds nothing wrong with this practice, just like he found nothing wrong with LRH doing it on the Apollo. And he said, quote, he falls into the water, he swims around, climbs up the ladder, gets off the dock, walks back in again. He never does that again. He knows that this is the way we operate. That is what the sea organization is like, end quote. So basically all the Scientology people who were like making fun of the executives for complaining about the swimming pool thing. They were like, ah, Sea Org's only for tough people, like only for real manly men and womanly women. And if you can't handle it, that's your problem. If you can't handle the abuse, if you don't like how you're treated, that's because you're weak, because you have thin skin, because you're not cut out for this, because you're not as good as the rest of us. 
Former Scientology executive Debbie Cook was also relegated to the hole, and she later filed a lawsuit against the Church of Scientology. She claimed that one night she was on the phone in her living quarters. She was talking to David Miscavige, um, discussing her poor performance, which is basically just David, like, screaming at her and telling her she sucks. And while she's on the phone with him, she began hearing someone pounding on the front door of her living quarters, which were located on Gold Base. Now, she said, I couldn't obviously really answer the door. I'm talking to David Miscavige. He's my boss. He's my leader. He's COB. And I can't just hang up on him or, like, stop listening to him. So she didn't do anything. She just kept listening to David. But before long, two male church officials had, like, pried the window to her room open, and they were crawling into her room to take her away. Debbie Cook remained in the hole for seven weeks with more than 100 other executives as she endured multiple abuses day after day. Debbie described being made to stand in a trash can for 12 hours while her fellow executives poured water over her. They screamed at her and called her a lesbian, which apparently in Scientology is a very bad thing to be. And we're going to revisit this later in this episode. Debbie Cook said another executive, Mark Nelson, was punished after objecting to the violence that he witnessed in the hole. Nelson was taken to a room where he was beaten by a male assistant of David Miscavige's and two other men for more than two hours. He was also made to lick the bathroom floor for 30 minutes. Debbie also said that David Miscavige ordered a female assistant of his to slap Debbie across the face and she was slapped so hard it caused her to fall over some chairs, and Miscavige ordered his communication officer to break Debbie's finger. Apparently, the communications officer, who I I suspect was Lou, but I don't believe Debbie ever actually specified that. This person bent Debbie's finger, but didn't break it, thank God. Debbie thought at one point David Miscavige himself was going to physically assault her. Where um, he was very angry and he um, walked around a, a long, very long conference table to get to me. He was yelling and um, he came up like as if he was going to choke me, but he didn't. He only, he basically grabbed my shoulders and, and shook me while he was yelling at me. We'll talk more in depth about what was happening in the hole in later episodes, but what you need to know now is that these people would be kept in there for months, years sometimes. Mike Rinder was kept prisoner in the hole for two years while he continued acting as a spokesperson for the church, being allowed to leave the hole occasionally to make church appearances or go on camera to deny that officials were being abused in Scientology at the very same time that he was being abused in Scientology. I've never seen anybody that had an arm broken or even a bruise or something drastic like that. Rathbun says this man, Mike Rinder, who was chief spokesman for the church, bore the brunt of the alleged abuse. And just starts beating on Mike Rinder. I mean savagely beating on him across the face, in the stomach. You know, Mike bends over. Miss Gavage grabs him around the neck. There's a little tree by his, by his room. Swings him around scrapes his face against a tree down into the mud and starts kicking the guy. Rinder's bleeding from the mouth because his face got scraped right across that tree. Rathbun says in 2000, he saw David Miscavige attack Mike Rinder again in a conference room. Miscavige came in, pinned Rinder up uh, under the table in his chair and was whacking him upside the head and then grabbed him around the the neck, uh, choked him and twisted him around and threw him to the ground by his neck. He had uh, marks on his neck for a week. After Mike Rinder and others left the church and spoke out about what was happening, some of their ex-wives went on Anderson Cooper's show and claimed that their ex-husbands were lying. And Mike Rinder says in Going Clear that these women were pulled out of the hole specifically to do this appearance, and then they were put back in the hole after they finished the appearance. Obviously, your ex-husbands have made charges against David Miscavige, saying that they have seen repeated acts of physical violence perpetrated by Mr. Miscavige. I, I, is any of that true? No. no. Not one no. ounce of it. Not one. Why, why do you think they're saying these things? I think that they are bitter individuals who once had a life that had glory and some form of power, and they now have nothing. 
They have no job. They have no life. And the media is giving them attention, and they're going for that attention. But we personally know, I mean, I slept with Tom DeVock for almost 20 years. I knew every inch of him. If he ever complained about something, if he had a headache, if he had a backache, he had me rub his feet at night. I mean, I was his wife. I never saw one scratch. I never saw one bruise. I never saw one black eye, nothing. Nor did he complain about anything personally. And he would have told me because any, anything that would happen, <laughs> I would know about. And besides that, that's not the character of Mr. David Miscavige. Nothing like that. It's outrageous that these men are doing that and they're bitter and they're getting attention from the media. And you were married to, to Marty Rathbun? 15 years. I know the men better than anybody else. Now, you gotta understand, Marty Rathbun is a liar, okay? When he left, he's alleging that when he left in 2004, it was because he witnessed Mr. Miscavige beating somebody up or whatever. As right after he left, I'm the first person he called. He called me right away. And it never came up. He never mentioned it, okay? He says that he did mention it to you. No, he did not. Absolutely not. It's a lie. Catherine, have you were married to Jeff Hawkins? Well, Yes, I was married to Jeff Hawkins during the entire time of these allegations that he said apparently happened. I was, you know, we were very close, obviously. We were married. He used to tell me about everything he did, the meetings he went to, etc. He never mentioned one thing. To the contrary, he mentioned to me how much Mr. David Miscavige supported him, how much he believed in him. Kelly, you were married to, to Mike Rinder yeah, I for was. a long time. Uh, he says that, that he was beaten by David Miscavige some 50 times. And, and multiple people have also said that they saw Mike Rinder bearing the brunt of David Miscavige's murder. Mike Rinder, Mr. Miscavige never laid a hand on Mike Rinder. I lived with Mike Rinder for over 35 years. I know every square inch of Mike Rinder's body. I know everything that's ever happened to him, every accident, every time he broke his wrist. I, I've been with him. We've been together all our lives. It's utterly ridiculous and it isn't true. I wonder if these women knew how brainwashed they sounded, right? You know, how their words sounded incredibly scripted and rehearsed. They were all saying roughly the same thing. I was married to him. He never mentioned this to me. I saw him naked. I saw every inch of his body. I never saw a bruise. I never saw a black eye. I knew everything about him, every ache, every pain. Mr. Miscavige never laid a finger on him. And it's not in Mr. Miscavige's great and honorable character to have done this. And the church would say, yeah, these men got violent with each other, but that's because they're violent people. But they certainly weren't told to be that way by David Miscavige. And then their ex-wives went on Anderson Cooper and regurgitated these claims. I certainly would have seen it. And the reason why I know that is I happened to be in a meeting in January 2004 when Marty Rathburn suddenly went and leapt on top of Mike Rinder and fought him to the ground and started choking him and beating him. How I, is it that no one came forward I will answer to you, call Anderson. the police? I will, answer, I will tell you. At that point in time, he had a personal conversation with me and said to me, and, I, I, and said to me specifically as he was bouncing his knee nonstop, Jenny, I think I'm going nuts. I think I'm crazy. And we thought, okay, we can help this man. We're going to have to help him with Scientology technology. Mm -hmm. It wasn't days later that he took off. So I, what is the procedure for dealing with somebody who is physically violent? I mean, because in any corporation in the United States, if, uh, if a superior assaulted, punched, kicked, strangled, uh, you know, somebody else in the company, that person would be out of the company and the police would be called. And what? he is out. And he was out. That's what you have to understand, yeah. Anderson. So Time. for about three years, according to members of the church, mm -hmm. your husband was physically assaulting it was, in, it was isolated incidents. It was well, a, this is an isolated incident. This is a consistent, virulent uh, physical harassment. Yeah, you're, that, we understand what you're saying. Yeah. And here's the, the fact. No, what, what I'm saying is that you, 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 you were married to a man who for three years had a, was a high-ranking member of this church who was assaulting people. And, and, and Mr. nothing Miscavige, seemed to be done about it. Mr. Miscavige was not at the, at the property at the time. Do you not have telephones? <clears throat> of course we have telephones. So I, I think you, you're being quite rude and quite insulting. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. There is no history of violence in the church. That there was isolated instances, and yes, you have that you do have written declarations that Marty Rathman was a violent man. Like even the way that uh, Catherine Bernardini says 
I saw Marty Rathbun leap on Mike Rinder, not Marty jumped on my husband. You know, it's, it's very formal. If I was talking about somebody attacking my husband or even my ex-husband, I'd say, oh, I saw so-and-so like attack Adam. I saw so-and-so jump on Adam because to me, he's Adam. He's not Adam Smith or Adam whatever the last name is. It's very much like these women were reading from a script that they had been instructed to not deviate from in any way, shape, or form. But that's just my opinion. Now, Marty's ex-wife also gets visibly very annoyed and defensive when Anderson Cooper rightly asks her, like, why this alleged violent behavior of Marty's was allowed to go unchecked for so long. And to me, that's a sign that someone doesn't have a logical answer or they weren't given their scripted answer to that specific question so they don't know what they are or are not allowed to say, which leads her to the bottom line statement. Marty Rathman was a violent man. I can't tell you why he was allowed to be violent. I can't tell you why he was allowed to beat the shit out of everyone for so long. I can only say that he was violent. And it's rude for you to ask me to explain that inconsistency. Anderson's face when she says, like, I think you're being very rude. He's like, so I, I think you, you're being quite rude and quite insulting. Here's the bottom line. You know, it's it's absolutely ludicrous. These women were so brainwashed, they didn't even realize they sounded brainwashed. John Brousseau, the man who built the hole, claims that when he left Gold Base in 2010, six years after he had built the hole, there were still roughly 80 to 100 executives imprisoned there. John said, quote, it was Miscavige at his absolute worst. There were a lot of people in there. I was never put in. I just put the bars on the doors. But the people outside, they talked about it like it was a comedy. You had to be in agreement, too. You didn't know who was going to turn you in. It was just this fear factor, end quote. Brousseau often saw the occupants of the hole as security guards marched them two abreast to a nearby maintenance garage to take showers. They looked like they knew they were being marched to the gallows. They, they just looked lifeless with no purpose, hung, you know, very hangdog, droopy shoulders, slouchy, you know, very sad, inward-looking features, you know. It was, it, was, it was not pleasant to look upon them. And I mean, according to human psychology, this makes a lot of sense. If you look at, you know, certain monarchies, certain kings, Henry VIII, Louis XIV, and you look at their court, basically the people around them, the people who live and worked at like Versailles, they were expected to behave in a certain way. And usually that meant just going along with whatever the king said. So even if you thought it was out of control, even if you thought it was horrible, even if you morally were repulsed by it, you would have to, in the presence of others, be like, oh, yeah, I completely agree, or joke about it, or make fun of those people, or denigrate those people, because your private thoughts don't matter at this point, and you don't know who you can trust. You don't know if the the gentleman you're sitting across from while you're playing cards is going to go and tell Louis the Fourteenth that you talk shit about him or you talk shit about his decisions. You don't know who you can trust. You don't know who's going to say what to who, and you don't want to be in that hole because you know it's bad you know it sucks so you just go along with it and i can't really blame people for doing this because at this point they're so mentally messed up they're so brainwashed they're like what do i believe what do i feel i think this is wrong but cob doesn't think it's wrong so maybe it's right you know it's just a complete mess in your mind and at the end of the day it's him or me it's him or me in that hole and i don't want it to be me Now, I tell you all of this stuff about the whole because it does speak to David Miscavige's state of mind in the years leading up to his wife's disappearance. And now I'm going to go back to Leah Remini, who was basically punished for even asking about Shelley. They could say that she was being, you know, re-educated because all of these reports had been written about her. But I tend to think that all these reports were written about her because she asked about Shelley and because she was making such a a big noise and a big fuss about Tom Cruise, who is 
Scientology's golden boy. But this still did not deter Leah from trying to uncover the answers to her questions. She claims that she would bring it up during her auditing sessions, at which point she would be brought outside where they weren't being recorded because auditing sessions are recorded. And she would be told, quote, Shelly is a Sea Org member and you're asking about the leader's wife. How do you expect people to react? I can't call COB and ask him, end quote. At one point, Leah bluntly asked if her auditor believed that Shelly was dead, and he responded, quote, I'm sure she's not dead, but you and I are not in a position to ask where the leader's wife is. I think it would be in your best interest to stop asking, end quote. Leah was then contacted by the Scientology member who was assigned as her handler to handle her, and his name was Shane. And Leah mentioned to Shane that it was odd she hadn't gotten a note or a card from Shelly in so long because they usually sent each other things for special occasions, and Shelly hadn't even sent a thank you note for a Christmas present that Leah had sent her, which was very unlike Shelly, who had good manners. Shane said the same thing, that he couldn't very well just ask where COB's wife was. After six years of this runaround, Leah went outside the lines she'd been taught to stay within, and she contacted Mike Rinder, who'd left the church in 2007. She learned about what had happened to himself and others at the behest of David Miscavige, and this led her to take to the internet to do some research of her own, something that Scientologists are strictly forbidden to do. In her book, Leah writes, quote, In Scientology, you're told to stay away from the internet or other forms of media or intelligence that might be against Scientology. I broke away from this long-held rule and looked at hundreds of stories about my church and just sat there and cried, not just for me, but for the many who believed in something that they thought was bigger than themselves and dedicated their whole lives to sustaining it, end quote. So Leah attempted to share this new information that she was learning with some of her closest friends. But of course, her closest friends were Scientologists. Leah had been a Scientologist since she was a little girl. And these friends, they basically were like, stop talking this way. Don't say this stuff. Like, you sound crazy. You shouldn't be reading this stuff. You sound like a suppressive person. And then they went and they told on her causing her to be summoned to the Celebrity Center and reprimanded for asking questions about Shelley and also for associating with suppressive people. Leah claims that two days later, her handler Shane and the commanding officer of the Celebrity Center, David Petit, they arrived at her house unannounced, and uh, she told them directly, like, the only thing I want to talk with you about is where Shelley Miscavige is. If you're not here to answer that question or give me some information, I have nothing to say to you. David Petit told her that Shelly was at Gold Base, which we know is not true, right? Shelly's not at Gold Base. But when Leah was like, okay, she's at Gold Base, easy enough, just get her on the phone. Let me hear her voice. Leah was told, well, we don't know the number to Gold Base. And this isn't actually that unbelievable because for a long time, for like the majority of her time in Scientology, Leah hadn't even known that Gold Base existed. It's for very, you know, upper levels of executives, Sea Org members. Leah threatened to go to the police and the FBI if she didn't get some answers, at which point tensions rose. Um, and Shane and David were asked to leave the house by Leah's husband, Angelo, because Angelo came in. He was like, oh, no, you're not going to talk to my wife like this. You're not going to yell at my wife. You best get to step in. After this, there were more reprimands, more sec checks, more finger pointing at Leah. She was the problematic part of this equation. She was the one causing all the issues. If you could just shut up, be quiet, focus on your work, focus on going up the bridge, none of this would be happening to you. Finally, Leah was compelled to take the step that would have her labeled a suppressive person. She went to the LAPD and filed a missing persons report on Shelley Miscavige. The report claims that Leah had not seen or heard from Shelley since August of 2007. Leah also told the police that the last in-person contact she'd had with Shelley had been during a large yearly event held at the Celebrity Center in August of 2006. And while Leah was helping Shelley get ready for this event, Shelley had been happy, talkative, behaving normally, until her husband would appear, at which point she would become nervous fearful, withdrawn, and timid. Leah said she felt it was obvious that Shelley was afraid of David Miscavige, but Shelley refused to talk about it. 
Leah claimed that she and other church members felt that Shelley had been secreted away to some unknown location where she was being held against her will and not being allowed to communicate with anyone on orders from her husband. The report also stated that there had been recent rumors of Shelley being held at a Church of Scientology facility located in the community of Running Springs in San Bernardino County. The location that this report is referring to is a 500-acre site near Lake Arrowhead known to Scientologists as Twin Peaks. Technically, this compound is the Church of Spiritual Technology, and in 2010, an anonymous online activist who has protested against Scientology and who goes by the online handle Angry Gay Pope, he took some photos and video of the facility. The compound is known as the most secretive unit in the organization of Scientology, and it's where the copyrights to all of L. Ron Hubbard's works are kept in order to preserve his legacy for future generations. The only people who seem to be allowed to enter the base are roughly two dozen Sea Org members who live and work there full time. Pretty much no one else in Scientology knows about this area, this location. No one else knows about Twin Peaks. Leah didn't even know about Twin Peaks. Dylan Gill, a former Sea Org member who lived there for seven years and oversaw some construction on the compound, claims that the base includes a luxurious log cabin that was specifically built in the event of L. Ron Hubbard's return. He also alleges that there's another structure on the compound that was designed and built to protect church VIPs like David Miscavige and his bestie, Tom Cruise, in case there's ever like a nuclear Armageddon. Dylan Gill says that the Church of Spiritual Technology has several buildings used for housing workers that are there doing the work of archiving LRH's writings. And like I said, the majority of Scientologists, even high-ranking ones, they did not know that this area existed for a long time. They probably still don't because, like I said, they're not allowed to go on the internet. Angry Gay Pope has been reporting on this location for a while, and in one of his posts, he said, quote, Built over 100 years ago as the area's first vacation spot for aristocrats, this outpost has many functions for Scientology. Its main purpose is to hold the sacred scriptures of leader L. Ron Hubbard in an underground vault along with other valuables. Hubbard's books are printed on metal plates which don't decay or fade like paper does. The plates are stored in airtight containers full of inert gas to prevent the metal from oxidizing or breaking down. The vault is protected from nuclear attack and helps guarantee that Ron's words will live on in the event that all Scientologists on Earth die. In that case, the vault is meant to be found by Scientologists who reincarnate on other planets and make their way back to the Scientology homeworld. The Church of Spiritual Technology has several such vaults in California and New Mexico, and those vaults often have markings on the ground visible from high in the air from which to attract space aliens, end quote. Now, obviously, I don't know how accurate all of this is, like the markings that are supposed to attract space aliens. I wouldn't be surprised. That's all I'll say. Other high-ranking officials who have been in Scientology have also sort of supported this statement that, yes, LRH's works are being put on metal plates so they don't like decay or deteriorate and they're put into like vaults with this inert gas they have confirmed that to some extent but is it crazy of all the things lrh believed of all the things he taught is it crazy to think that he would have instructed these vaults to be built with like markings that you could see from a spaceship because if scientologists die they are going to be reincarnated they live you know, multiple lives, all their thetans are going to fly out and go back into different bodies and all of that stuff. And then they're going to want to find these these things again, right? When they come back to Earth, they're going to want to find the writing so that they can rebuild the Church of Scientology. So, I mean, of all the crazy things I hear on the day-to-day, this isn't the craziest thing. This isn't the most unbelievable or out of the realm of possibility. Here is some footage from Angry Gay Pope. And I have to admit, he's pretty hilarious. Pretty hilarious. I'm the angry gay pope. Yeah, I'm. A- We're looking for Shelly Miscavige. Have you seen her? I don't know. See, we got friendlies already. Hi. Would you come talk to us about Shelly Miscavige? Can you come and talk? <laughs> this is so funny. 
Now, you don't need to fumble with your numbers. You've only, you've only got two buttons there. We just want to speak to Shelly Miscavige. See, that checks for license plates. Maybe that's Shelly Miscavige, actually. It's the right age and everything. Free Shelly Miscavige! So look at all the spikes facing inwards. See, that's a restricted area there. Well, there's ultra barrier everywhere on the fences here. How come you have so much ultra barrier here? Why do you have so much ultra barrier here? You're not, you're not answering me. I'm on the easement. Call the cops. Call the cops. This is called the public easement. I'd like to talk to them to you about to them about why your ultra barrier is here. Really? Maybe you're trying to keep Shelly Miss Cabbage inside. None of these other houses have bare fences. Who's Shelly Miss Cabbage? Who are you? I'm the Angry Gay Pope. Who are you? Yeah, go to angrygaypope.com. Oh, you're not allowed to use the internet, though. Yeah, yeah. Kendrick Mox and I are buddies. Are you saying you're a yes, I'm a faggot. Yes. And page 125 of Dianetics says that I'm an evil person and that I'm bad and that homosexuals are evil. So I've decided to come out here and check Scientology out for myself. So is that where you get your amazing body thetan powers by spinning people around in that? How much do you charge to spin around in that? $5,000? $10,000? Huh? Why don't you use your OT powers to destroy me? Where, where are you on the bridge? Uh, you must not be high enough to have OT powers then, because you would have used your OT powers to destroy me. Yes, destroy me, sweetheart. Destroy me. No, I'm not. I'm clearly on the easement. And we will talk to the cops about it. Uh, no, I'm going to continue walking along the fence to see the fence breaks. Let the dogs out. Let the dogs out. Are you Mr. Burns? Release the hose. You know, why don't you turn on a surround sound speaker system? Or why don't you uh, turn on the sprinklers? What? Uh, you're la you make me laugh. Now, I'm very sorry. I apologize if some of the language that was used in this video was offensive to you. I'm regarding specifically to the name that angry gay pope was called by one of those Scientology members who I will say he did identify her in his video, but I blocked her name out here because I'm not going to have this video blocked for doxing people. And I don't agree with doxing people, even Scientologists. But I wanted you to see this is a belief in Scientology that homosexuality is wrong and evil. And I'm sure it's not a belief held by all Scientologists, but many former members have claimed that when they were being, you know, insulted, harassed, tortured, when others were trying to make them feel bad about themselves, they would be insulted by being called gay or lesbians as a way of, like, putting them down. But, dude, he had me rolling in this. Like, I loved the way he just kind of went with it when she said that really ugly, horrible word to him. He was like, yeah, yeah. Why don't you use your OT powers to destroy me? Where are you on the bridge? Are you Mr. Burns? Like, release the dogs? Are you Mr. Burns? And that's what I'm saying. Like, humor is incredibly important in the face of tense situations, in the face of hate, in the face of somebody who's trying to get under your skin. The best way to respond is with humor. Like, you didn't bug me. What you're saying to me says more about you than it says about me. And I find it humorous. You didn't get under my skin. You didn't bug me. Now, obviously, from these videos and these pictures, we can see that there is a high level of security at this place. There's fences with spikes. There's, like, armed security guards, cameras everywhere. And I'm not saying that these measures are taken to keep people prisoner. I'm just saying the place is locked up like a vault. And if LRH's works are there, that could be the reason why. That that makes sense. But this is allegedly where Shelley Miscavige is and has been since she was last seen in 2007. So Leah Remini filed a report with the police on August 5th, 2013. And you might be thinking, finally, finally, someone who isn't a Scientologist is going to be on the case, right? Right? Well, it, once again, it might not be so cut and dry. In her book, Leah claims that the Church of Scientology 
is known to not only pay big money to off-duty LAPD officers to work security at the Celebrity Center, but the church also employs a practice called safe pointing. Once again, one of LRH's ideas, one of his terms. Safe pointing is part of the Scientology PR strategy for creating a safe operations base within a community. So, the Scientologists concentrate on ingratiating themselves with influence peddlers. And these influence peddlers reach out to the broader community on behalf of Scientology. You might say Tom Cruise is an influence peddler, right? Leah says that the church invites members of various police and sheriff departments to speak at events. The church presents these law enforcement officials with awards. And Scientology donates a crap load of money to their charities. When Leah had initially reported Shelley Miscavige missing, she'd first called a friend of hers, Kevin Becker, who was also a police detective. Kevin then went to the head of his unit, Deputy Chief Beatrice Germala, and he requested to handle the report personally. You know, he was like, it's high profile. It's Leah Remini. She's a close friend of mine. She trusts me. She wants this handled, you know, efficiently. But... Beatrice instructed him to send the report to the missing persons unit of the LAPD. Basically, like, you know, you can't handle this, just move the report on. So Kevin did this, but after a few days, he called over there to follow up on the report. And he was told that someone from the LAPD had spoken to a lawyer from Scientology who claimed Shelley was fine and did not want to be found. When asked if anyone from law enforcement had spoken to Shelley directly, Kevin claims he was told no. So the LAPD released a statement on August 8, 2013, stating that the case was closed and Leah's report about Shelley being missing was unfounded. So Leah called up Lieutenant Andre Dawson, who was in charge of the investigation. And she was like, what's up with this? You know, like, did you talk to her? Did you see Shelley? And she was told that he couldn't discuss the details with her. Tony Ortega spoke to Lieutenant Andre Dawson, and Tony was told that two detectives had met with Shelley and that she was fine. Now, Dawson would not say where the meeting happened, and when he was asked if the conversation with Shelley had taken place in the presence of other church officials, Dawson claimed that this was classified. Why is this important? Because if Shelley was in the presence of, like, her handler or someone else who's going to report back to David— she's obviously not going to tell the truth or she may not feel so safe openly talking about how she's actually feeling. Right. So you did what didn't she release some sort of a statement or someone um, released some sort of a statement? Someone did. I don't know who it was from. To respond uh, to your accusations, that it, right. right? They they said that they had made contact with her and she didn't want to be found. I said, "Did you see her or was she being was somebody speaking on her behalf? You ready for the answer? That's classified. This is what the police said. And I said, are you sick? I said, sir, sir, are you sick? There's something wrong with you? Am I doing something wrong? I filed the report. You know that, right? Like, you know that I filed the report? I, I thought maybe he was confused and he thought he was talking to my cousin. I said, no, it, like, I filed the report. Of course you're going to give me the information. I need to know if you saw her or the, the officers that you sent there saw her. Did anybody give her my note? If, uh, did you, did they, was she okay? Was she, did you take her off the base? Did you say you wanted to speak to her alone? He said, I can't give you any of that information. Could you imagine? Then I had to spend more money, Joe, because this is not free. I had to spend more money on a lawyer to do a follow-up on the public information acts. I asked specific questions. Who did you see? Did you see her? Was she alone? Where did you see her? What did she look like? They didn't give me the information. They go, yeah, you can get that information if you pay two, two more dollars. Okay, we well, paid the two more dollars. And then the thousands of dollars it cost me to get a lawyer to draft up the letter. So it's still ongoing. I still don't have answers. This is a person who worked around the clock for him and, and was his wife. What do you think happened? I don't know, which is why I filed the have report. Have you heard anything? No. So no one who used to be a part of the church has contacted you? There would be no, okay, anybody who would, anybody who I would need to talk to me is up behind gates in Riverside County at this gold base. Anybody that I would need to come out and talk to me and give me information, the FBI information, would be behind those gates.
And what Leah is talking about um, regarding her FOIA requests, that's very accurate. I've experienced it many times myself. When they don't want to give you information, they'll give you the runaround. They'll tell you um, this is going to take more time or you need to pay more money or you need to pay some ridiculous amount of money. It's so obvious what they're doing, yet it's allowed to happen. Now, this isn't the first time the LAPD has been accused of looking the other way when it concerns something nefarious happening with a member of Scientology. And I'm specifically referring to the rape allegations that Danny Masterson has been facing for years. And there will be a specific episode discussing this, trust me. But there's a lot of evidence that the LAPD and the Church of Scientology share a close and profitable relationship, specifically the LAPD's Hollywood division. In 2016, Corey Palka was newly appointed to be the captain of the LAPD's Hollywood division. And um, Corey Palka seems to have a close relationship with the Celebrity Center and Scientology. You can find pictures of him hanging out at the Celebrity Center. I mean, he posted pictures on Twitter, on his Twitter, of events at the Celebrity Center. He even allowed the Church of Scientology to install an informational kiosk in his station house. Why is that wrong? It's wrong for many reasons. Because it's in the Constitution, right? Separation of church and state. No government official, no official acting in the name of a local or federal government should be trying to push any specific religion on you. Also, it's very obvious, by 2016, Scientology was incredibly controversial. All of these exposés had, like, come out about them. And there was a lot of talk about criminal activities happening. So why would Corey Palka and the LAPD align themselves with such a controversial entity? The answer is, as usual, money. Leah Remini said, quote, Scientology is very slick and that it's partnered with this Police Activities League with the Hollywood Division. And every year around Christmas time, Celebrity Center presents the Hollywood Police Department with a check for this Police Activities League, which gives back to children, end quote. The Celebrity Center has also hosted many fundraising events for the Hollywood Police Activities League, and Danny Masterson was present for several of these, including in 2008 and 2013. And once again, I'm going to bring you back to the fact, the evidence that Danny Masterson has been accused of sexual assault and rape by multiple women who were involved in Scientology. He was charged with the rape of three women in, I believe, June of 2020. And he's going to a criminal trial for this this summer. I think his trial starts in August of 2022. So we're definitely going to cover this. We're going to talk about this and we're going to do a whole uh, episode or two on Danny. Now, these women who brought allegations against Danny, they claimed that they were told by the LAPD downtown division that the Hollywood division had been hopelessly compromised by Scientology. And the downtown detectives allegedly told these women that they weren't even going to enter their reports or their information into the LAPD's computer system so that nothing would come up should someone in the Hollywood department search for it. In March of 2017, when the story about these allegations hit the media and the LAPD was being pressed for a comment, Captain Corey Palka sent an email to another LAPD official, Richard Gabaldon, and he asked in this email, quote, is this ours, Rich, or some other entity, end quote. To me, that kind of shows that what the downtown LAPD detectives were saying to these victims was true. You know, the information about the allegations had been withheld from Hollywood Division, even though the assaults had happened in their jurisdiction, because the captain of Hollywood Division apparently didn't even know about these assaults, or he wouldn't have sent an email to his colleague being like, what's going on with this? And remember Beatrice Bermala, the woman who insisted that Leah's police officer friend Kevin send the missing persons report on Shelley to the LAPD missing persons division instead of handling himself? Well, she was sent a lovely email from Scientology member Greg LeClaire in November of 2017. I'm going to read that email to you now. Dear Assistant Chief Beatrice Bermala, well, I sincerely hope everything is going well for you. First, I will just say we miss you as our Hollywood Division Commander. Of course, we have enjoyed a great relationship with both Captain Zarcone and Captain Palka, but we are allowed to miss you. So we do. 
We wanted to extend an invitation for you to attend our Christmas Stories benefit again this year, being staged on two nights as always, the first Friday and second Saturday of December. This is our 25th year producing the show, so we are doing all we can to make it very special. We added up the total, and it's hard to believe, but this show has raised more than $400,000 for the LAPD Hollywood Division Youth Development Programs since 1993. Obviously, we are very proud of that, but more importantly, it's the thousand upon thousands of children reached and guided to live a better quality of life that is truly important. So, if you are available, we'd love to have you either night, but I just found out that on Friday night, we still have the need for an LAPD official to accept the check of $20,000, so we'd love to have you fill that capacity, if you can. However, if you would rather just come to enjoy the show, that would be just fine as well. Bring as many guests as you'd like. Please let me know if you can make it. And for a trip down memory lane, here are a few highlights of the shows over the years. So what is Greg LeClaire talking about? What are these Christmas stories? Well, according to Scientologynews.org, it's a charity variety show that's put on to raise money for the LAPD's youth programs. And it's raised more than $460,000 for underprivileged children in Hollywood since 1993. And that's great. You know, I'm sure that money helped a lot of people, but that money, in my opinion, is also being dangled like a carrot in front of the LAPD. Money for your programs in exchange for maybe you going easy on us in exchange for some possible protection, some possible spinning if that needs to happen. This email even sort of hints at that, in my opinion. We added up the total of all the money we've given you. It's hard to believe, but wow, wow, we've given you guys so much money over the years, exclamation point, exclamation point. We haven't forgotten how high that total amount is, have you? And hey, I just found out we have more money to give you. We have 20 grand more to give you. So we would really love for you to come and collect that. Bring as many guests as you want. Enjoy all that the cornucopia of Scientology has to offer. All the celebrities who take part in these Christmas stories. You know, you're not going to be able to see this stuff anywhere else. Just don't look too hard while you're there. That's the deal. This is just my synopsis of it, right? I'm paraphrasing. Obviously, Greg LeClaire didn't say any of this stuff, but in my opinion, if I'm reading this, knowing what the relationship might be like, that's what I'm taking from it. Greg LeClaire also sent Captain Corey Palka some pictures that were taken at the 2016 Christmas Stories event. And Palka responded with the quote, Greg, thanks so much. Those are three of the best pictures I've seen all year. You guys rock. Thanks for sharing some time with me today. Your commitment to our kids is incredible, Corey, end quote. It's almost as if Scientology feels that the LAPD are like their friends, their own personal security. And this is illustrated, I believe, in a 2017 email sent from Scientology member Kristen Peterson. Good morning, Captain Palka. I wanted to ask for your guidance on something. The second season of Remini's show is going to begin tonight. We have already started getting an increase of hate mail just with the teasers, so I am expecting the threats to start up shortly after the first episode tonight. Previously, I was going to the Hollywood station to report any threats we received, but sometimes that is difficult, as they are not the normal types that the officers at the front desk are used to dealing with. Then in January, I was advised I could work directly with the threat management unit, which has been very helpful, but does not result in my ending up with a police report documenting the fact that we received and reported a threatening communication. I fully realize that a lot of what we report will not necessarily go anywhere as far as investigation and prosecution, but I still feel very strongly that I must report and properly document that I did so. Part of the reasoning on this is that we have experienced that we will get a random threat and then down the road it connects to another more serious one. Combining the two then starts to build a case that can sometimes then get pursued on law enforcement or legal lines. Bottom line of my request is guidance on how to best set up a line with an officer at your station that I can make these reports with, simply to document the fact that they occurred, so I can have it reported to the police and can come away with a document showing that I did. The yellow police report copies that I get when I go to the station is enough for the purpose of documenting the harassment and the threats. Any guidance you can provide on this would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Kirsten. And then Corey Palka responded, Hi, Kirsten. I will have an officer who is available to you directly that can document these incidents. Thank you for reaching out to me. Okay, so this is an issue, see? Um, like, these people, these Scientologists, they are guarded 
to the teeth. They've got personal security guards on every base. They've got cameras. They've got like motion sensors. They've got fences with spikes. But they need the LAPD to come in and save them from mean words. They need the taxpayers of Los Angeles and California to fund their private security force. And I'm not saying that these threats that uh, Kirsten claims they're getting are false. I'm sure that Scientology gets a ton of threats, whether they're more benign with just like insults and, you know, saying you're terrible, you're, what you're doing to people is terrible, et cetera, et cetera. Or if they're escalating to a point where somebody in Scientology feels like their life might be in danger, I'm sure they're getting these reports. But you are basically asking the LAPD to provide you a personal police officer who is now responsible for documenting and giving you a police report for every one of these emails or messages that you find to be threatening or distasteful. And the fact of the matter is Scientology as a whole, I'm sure gets like thousands of these a day. Maybe some are well-deserved, maybe some are overboard, but I'm sure they get a ton. Like this is a full-time job. And as a business, as a corporation, which Scientology is, right? It's a business. It's a corporation. Like it's a church you know, because they're tax exempt, but but it's also a, a business and a corporation like Amazon. Let's say Amazon, every time they got a mean word sent to them or Jeff Bezos got an email that scared him, he's got a personal detective in the police force who's just like there at his beck and call to file a report. And they don't really need a, a physical police report for every single threat that they receive. All they really need to do, as Kirsten Peterson put it, is keep this correspondence in whatever form it came in and document that you received it. And that way you, yourself, can have this sort of running log of threatening activity. And you can put two and two together. Like if one threat leads to another threat or if one threat connects to a later threat, like that's your job to do that. Every time someone watches Leah Remini's show and then – you know, is disgusted by what they see. And then they send you a letter saying like, you're disgusting. I think your religion is bullshit. I think that you're false prophets and what you're doing to people is horrible. You can't be calling your own personal LAPD officer and being like, hmm, Officer Smith, they're being mean to me. It's just, it's a little ridiculous. It's a little much. And I'm not saying that there's definitely something nefarious going on between Scientology and the LAPD. But I am saying that there's an argument there for conflict of interest. Scientology has been accused of a lot of terrible things over the years. Um, I, like I could start listing them, but a lot of terrible things. And it's best if the agency that's responsible for investigating those accusations isn't indebted to the organization, because obviously that may cloud their judgment. Now, many previous Scientologists do believe that Shelley Miscavige is currently at Twin Peaks, and they believe that she's a prisoner in some sense of the word, but she may be a willing prisoner. It has been reported that even to this day, Shelley is a diehard follower of L. Ron Hubbard, and like many other very devout Scientologists, she believes that he will be coming back to Earth, probably in a different body, and at that point, she will be vindicated and rewarded. For her steadfast loyalty. It's very possible that Shelley could walk out of Twin Peaks. She could leave at any time. But because she is such a true believer, she's not going to do that. So in a way, she's a prisoner of herself and the lifetime of brainwashing that she's endured. Here's former Scientology member Aaron Smith-Levin giving his opinion on this. And when he mentions Intbase, he's talking about Goldbase. And when he says CST or CST base, he's referring to Twin Peaks. Even Leah says she had no idea of the existence of or the location of the Intbase. Golden Air Productions and the Intbase are. Uh, Golden Air Productions is a film studio located on the Intbase. So when she says she didn't know um, about the existence of Golden Era Productions or where it was. She's referring to the Int Base. So Leah, not even Leah, knew where the Int Base was, much less even knew of the existence of these CST bases. Even people who've worked at the Int Base for 30 years, unless they're at CST, unless they are posted at CST, they do not know the location of the CST bases. So uh, I feel like that that sort of factors into uh, the overall context of no one's seen Shelley. Are you kidding me? The most dedicated SEER members in the world don't even know the location of the base where Shelley's at. <laughs> that is how confidential and closely held information about these bases are within the world of Scientology. And by the way, that is not to mean that these bases are used as like, uh, you know, uh, prison islands or something. 
These bases, the, P, the Sea Org members manning these bases are the most highly qualified Sea Org members in all of Scientology. Being posted at CST is not a punishment. It is one of the highest promotions you can get. And this is something I'm not sure the, the members of the real world understand. They, they see photos of the bases, they see the fences that are around them, and they think, oh, these must be like prisons. Well, they might have security similar to the security you would have at a prison. But remember, uh, security works both ways. It can keep people from getting out. It can keep people from getting in. I can tell you from a Scientology perspective, the security at those bases is prevented to keep people from getting in. That doesn't mean Miscavige didn't send Shelly there so that she can be as far away from any other Sea Org members and Scientologists as possible. Both of, both of these things can be true at the same time. If Shelly is there as a punishment, she's the only one. You do not get punished by being promoted to CST. So in some respects, uh, in some respects, you could say that Shelly didn't even get demoted. She got transferred from RTC to CST. And in other respects, and I do believe this to be the case, that David Miscavige transferred her there because it was also an extremely convenient way of giving her as little connection as possible to as many other Sea Org members as possible. But it doesn't mean Shelly doesn't want to be there. Do you see what, where I'm going with this? Just because she's there, just because there's a fence around the place, just because there's private security guarding the place, doesn't mean she doesn't want to be there. They don't believe in David Miscavige, but they believe in Elrond Hubbard, and they're waiting for his return. And if she's alive and well, Shelly Miscavige believes that, I think. Okay, so Tom here acknowledges that Shelly would be one of those people who believes LRH is coming back, L. Ron Hubbard is coming back, has a loyalty to L. Ron Hubbard, believes in the mission of Scientology, believes in L. Ron Hubbard's vision for Scientology and for the world, and would be dedicated enough to want to put up with whatever she has to put up with to still be there when LRH comes back. Well, you can't really have it both ways. You can't say she's there because she wants to be and say she's being held against her will. And that again is at the heart of this issue. Former Sea Org members, you will not hear former Sea Org members say that she's being held against her will because that's just not how the Sea Organization works. Yes, when you get in trouble and you're, uh, there's like an acute problem and people are worried you're gonna dip, <laughs> you're gonna blow, you're gonna go AWOL, you'll be assigned, you'll be put under watch, you'll have people assigned to you, you'll have people sleeping outside your bedroom door, they'll make it impossible for you to leave. But the way this works in the world of Scientology is they, they keep you there until they can handle you, until you decide you don't want to leave. And once they're convinced you don't want to leave, then you're back to being sort of a, a normal person with normal rights and normal privileges, whatever those rights and privileges may be, depending on which organization you're at and things like that. Now, again, normal people in the normal world watching this video are gonna go, don't you realize how fucking crazy that is? <laughs> and I go, yes, I absolutely realize how crazy that is. I've been through it myself a million times. And from having gone through it myself, ha from having gone through it myself, I can tell you that when you come out the other end, you definitely still want to be there. You definitely have changed your mind and have rededicated yourself to the cause and no longer want to leave. I'm not saying that's healthy. I'm not saying that's good or natural. I'm saying eventually we cannot really 10, 13, 15 years later still be acting like Shelly's being held in a dungeon against her will. It's not how Scientology works. It's not how the Sea Org works. Go ahead and follow Aaron if you want to go deeper into Scientology. He's got some great stuff on his channel. But now I hand this off to you. What do you think about all of this? Do you think Shelly's being held prisoner? Or is she just so brainwashed and so convinced that her belief system is the end-all be-all that she can't imagine living in a world where she's not a Scientologist or where she's declared a suppressive person? Like if L. Ron Hubbard comes back and she's been, you know, kicked out or she's left of her own free will and she's been declared a suppressive person, he's not going to look fondly upon that. But isn't that kind of just as bad, if not worse? You know, if she's a prisoner of her own mind due to the manipulation she's gone through, isn't a church or a religion or an organization that renders people so hopelessly dependent 
kind of bad? Shouldn't they be looked at with closer scrutiny? Shouldn't they be investigated, not just handed tax-exempt status and set loose on the unsuspecting population? Like, shouldn't there be some kind of checks and balances? There just doesn't seem to be, not on a federal level and certainly not on a local level. But let me know what you think in the comments. And also let me know if you want me to continue with this series because the next one will be on L. Ron Hubbard himself. And there's a lot to discuss there. Believe you me, like there's a lot to discuss. Um, it's very interesting. He lived a very interesting life. Aaron and I were talking about it and we both agreed that was kind of funny because LRH has claimed to do so many things that he didn't do in order to make his life and his accomplishments seem much more, you know, important. But even without all of those embellishments, LRH still lived a very, like, eventful and interesting life. Far more interesting than my life, you know, where I never leave the house. So there's there's a lot of stuff to talk about there. Let me know if you want to see more Scientology content. Obviously, I don't want to continue on with the series if the majority of you aren't interested or you don't like it. But just let me know in the comments and I'll kind of take the temperature from there. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much for listening to this. I know this video is probably very long and there's a lot of information, but I really look forward to talking about it with you in the comments. Don't forget to follow me on social media, Instagram and Twitter. All of the handles are in the description box along with the links to Native so you can get your body wash and your deodorants. Also, my link to my podcast, Crime Weekly, is in the description box. So check out that podcast if you're looking for different content in between when I post on YouTube. Thank you so much for being here. Like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already so that YouTube notifies you when I post a new video. Even though if I post a new video about Scientology, they probably won't notify you anyways because why are you protecting Scientology, YouTube? Why are you protecting Scientology? Anyways, thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, stay a suppressive person, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings